woman whose little daughter was possessed by an impure spirit came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek born in Syrian Phoenicia. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. First let the children eat all they want, he told her, but it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Lord, she replied, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he told her, for such a reply, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. She went home and found her child lying on the bed. The demon gone. That is quite a disturbing and challenging passage. Because the Lord Jesus seems to speak in a way that we in our culture would deem deeply offensive. To call any woman in any context a dog in this country is a deep and vicious insult around her looks and everything else that goes with her. But what we have to do for a moment is pause and look at what's actually going on here. Because I'd like to take you back for a moment, if I may, to who she's speaking to. We call him Jesus. I am who I am. I am he. I am the gate. I am the life. So it's the name that resides in him. Now, if you read the Old Testament, in that book, the Hebrew word name, when it's ever associated with the divine, stands for essential nature and or his reputation. Hence why you hear, I will not give my glory to another. You, Israel, have caused me to be blasphemed among the nations. You have brought my name into disrepute. My name will not. My name will not. It's about who God essentially is. So when we say name, if we think of his essential nature, just one verse, two verses, bear with me. Exodus 34. Yahweh descends in the clouds and he stands there with Moses and proclaims his name, his essential nature, saying, Yahweh, Yahweh God, merciful and gracious, patient and compassionate and true. Yahweh declares to Moses a list of the divine attributes. So this God, whom Jesus claims to be incarnate and in person, is the God that said to Moses, I am essentially merciful, gracious, patient, compassionate and true. That's who I am. In Psalm 138, it's usually translated in our Bibles, you have magnified your word above all your name. Yet the Hebrew is better translated as, you have magnified your word upon all your name, your essential nature. You have magnified your nature. You will say who you are again and again. Who, and I've said it a thousand times from every pulpit I preached in, we have to know who this God is. What is his essential nature? Who is he? And as I said this morning, what does he ask of us? When he puts his cloak round us and says we are his, what does he want from us in response? Day by day, minute by minute, sun up when the sun comes up and down. An ordinary, everyday, mundane life comes in. What does he want? Well, he's declared his essential nature. Proverbs 18, we sing this with the kids, don't we? The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it. And they are saved. It's the same thing. So this God sits in Jesus. This compassionate God, who's in essential nature, is a strong tower, a safe place. John 17 is one of the greatest passages. I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours and you gave them to me and they have kept your word. What he's saying is your essential nature has been manifested to them. So he says, Thomas, don't you know me? When I've, Philip, don't you know me when I've been amongst you all this time? The essential nature of God resides in Jesus. But this is where it gets a little more complicated for this Syrophoenician woman. Because he's come initially, and this is where we Christians get this very wrong to me. He's come initially to the Jews of Israel. As I said this morning, you don't hear many Gentiles until Acts 10. Yes, there are a few, but there are not many. Because he has come to be presented as the king of Israel. He is showing himself to the Jewish people and saying, I am your king. Here is the proof. All the healings, they should have gone to the priests and seen. This is the power of Jesus. Therefore, their Messiah has come. But they wouldn't. They refused. So he says, oh, Jerusalem, how I long to gather you, but you were not willing. It will be left to you desolate. And if you read the prophecies, it says two lots will, will be scattered and this will happen, and that's exactly what the Romans do over AD 79 and 130. That's exactly what they do to the point where they destroy the temple. So the essence resides in God. 
but he has come initially to the Jewish people that they may receive their king, as they have longed for and promised, but they miss it. That's why you see Jesus say this generation a lot, this generation, this generation, this generation, because this is the generation to whom he came. He manifested, he lived among them, not us, them, and they refused to see it. So let me just quickly, please, you'll make, I hope this makes sense. In Genesis 12, God promises Abraham a land, a name, a nation of him, a divine protection and the good news to the Gentiles. You see, here it comes. Through them should be the good news. Through them, we should have seen something in Israel that made us say, what have you got? Circumcision on the eighth day. It's the best time to do it. And when they've noticed the more circumcision, the less cervical cancer. There's all kinds of reasons that they would have seen something. But Israel doesn't do it. It goes in on itself. And this was before Abraham had said yes or no to the only thing that he was actually told to do to make this happen. Leave his land and father's household and go to Canaan. He's told to do this. Genesis 15 is God's covenant of the land promised to Abraham. It was unconditional because there was nothing Abraham did or needed to do to earn this. He was put into a deep sleep by God, and God literally makes a covenant by passing through the pieces. You've heard me say this, God makes the covenant with himself. And he's saying, if I break this covenant, may this be done to me. So he's, God is establishing an eternal covenant with Abraham and the people who will follow him through Jacob, which is the Jews, to the land of Israel. That ain't popular, but it's the truth. It's what he does. The next is Genesis 17. God's unconditional covenant was passed on to Isaac even before Isaac was born. Later, God confirms the covenant to Isaac. Genesis 25. God's unconditional covenant was promised to Jacob and not Esau. This was before, again, Jacob was born or did anything to earn or spurn it. God confirms the covenant. And on and on we go. God confirms this covenant consistently to the people of Israel. And then comes the promise of Messiah as it unfolds, as they sin, as they're not the light to the Gentiles, as they don't keep covenant. As I said this morning, they become prostitutes. They, they long for kings like other gods, other nations. They want the other nations' gods. But then he comes to the Jews initially. He presents his credentials as their Messiah. And they refuse to hear it or to listen. So this is what he's doing here. He's saying when he says, let the children eat the bread saying, first off, look, I have come to the house of Israel. It is to them first that I have come. It is for them to hear the message, for them to see demons driven out. They will then proclaim me Messiah. That's what he's saying here. He's not saying that you're horrible, you're you're a dog, you're ugly, I want nothing to do with you. He's simply saying you're not a Jew. And as he said to his mum, now is not my time. Mum, what has this to do with me? My time is not yet. I think this is what Jesus is trying to say to her. It is not yet your time. The blessings have not yet come to you. They will through Messiah's death. That's what Paul says. He opens that gate that we are grafted in. That the spiritual blessings that were not ours as Goyim, as Gentiles, become ours through Messiah. And without these covenants and these promises, there's no Messiah. Without Messiah, there's no salvation. And it goes round in a circle. Do you see this? That's why I said it's for us now to pray for them. To pray that they will come back in and see their Messiah to see what's going on, and to pray for Jews to be enlightened that their Messiah has come. Because we should, we owe them a debt, and we cannot boast over them. And we cannot do, because he has given them the covenants and they have given it us. That's why I, as your vicar, can have nothing to do with divest, boycott, and all this nonsense. And this idea that it's a Nazi state, it isn't. Well, that's a different thing. I want to stick to this. So what's going on is, this is a Greek woman who's trying it. So this is why she says, this is why he says, sorry, um, let the children eat first. So they've got to be filled up first. They've got to make a decision first. And you and I are born later into what comes when they, are, when they reject him. And Paul says for a time they were cut off, so we are grafted in. And if they're cutting off his life to us, what will their engrafting be? But blessings. So he's not finished with them. And then she says, but even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. In other words... What she's saying is, I know, but whatever you will give me, I will have. Whatever falls, however small, whatever crumb you can give me, you are a Jew and I am a Greek. We see it when he meets the woman at the well. You are a Jew, I am a Samaritan. You worship there, I worship here. Why are you even talking to me? You should have nothing to do with me. It was dangerous for a Jew to be in a Samaritan area. They could be physically attacked and often were. Hence you get that parable about the beaten up Jew and the Samaritan. It would have been 
It was the equivalent of going back to the troubles in Northern Ireland and basically saying that a Catholic or a Protestant could go into the opposite place and start shouting things and expect not to get physically attacked. It would happen. Their loathing was great. So what she's saying here is, anything you can give me, oh God of the Jews, I know I'm not one. I know I have no part in this right now, but what will you, anything you can give, I'll take even a crumb. And in a way she is, she's saying, yes, okay, I'm outside. I have no place here. I have no right to ask you this. You are this God of this covenant, of this hope, and I have no place, but I'll take whatever you can give. And here's the thing with Jesus, again and again and again, he is stunned by faith or the lack of it. Remember we had one where he came and he said he was stunned by the unbelief? He's stunned by her belief. He's stunned by other people who have utter faith. In fact, doesn't he get into trouble by saying that even in, he didn't find such faith even in Israel? And the Jews react to him quite violently because a Gentile had more faith than they did. Because what the Jews were more interested in is by whose authority did he do these things? By whom had he studied? Which rabbi had taught him? What credentials could he show? Could he show he'd been ordained in the right manner by the right bishop at the right time? Because I have to do that. I have to present my credentials on my ordination day. Swear allegiance to the queen. Show my papers. Show this. Show that. Jesus didn't have any of that. So they weren't listening to him. So basically, he's not telling her she's a dog and cut off and rude. He's saying, the time is not yet for you. But she's so desperate, she's saying, I know this, but you can do what you want. And I will take whatever crumb that you can give, I'll have it. And I wonder sometimes, does that come across to us as Christians? That when we see people, is it that we can give them the least crumb spiritually? That may spark something in them? To see when they come in the building who we are. And they may say, you know, oh, I'm no good, I'm no good, I'm useless, God can't forgive me. That's the greatest thing I think we often hear. I'm so bad you don't know what I've done. You have no idea who I am. No, you're right, I don't. But don't you know that I was once a sinner? I too did things that I thought were unforgivable. What spiritual nourishment are you looking for? What crumbs from the master's table do you seek? And we will give them you. And that comes back to us as Christians. This idea that comes to us, and that you know, we're no good, we can't pray, we're unworthy. All of that is true. But Jesus has made you worthy. Jesus has, like I said this morning, has chosen you and called you his own. And not this, you are no longer are we dogs and crumbs under the table. The Messiah was rejected and crucified and all spiritual blessings in the heavenly realms belong to you and me. They are ours. And I go back to what I said this morning, how I long to see gifts of the Spirit flow in this church so that we know and can worship and be certain of who we are in him. That in this world of mass confusion, uncertainty, where people don't know what's going on, where a Labour politician can't even say what a woman is, when we're in this kind of confusion, where children are going through surgery that they cannot undo and it affects the rest of their life, when we're seeing what social media does, when we're hearing, I'm sorry, when, when a lady goes missing and people go and stand in that spot and tell their friends on TikTok and other sites that's where they are, something in our nation has gone decidedly wrong and something is not right in this land. And my thing is this, as I said this morning, we cry, but I am wondering more and more, are we close to that point where God says, pray for them no more? The only thing left is judgment. Disagree with me. I don't know. I'm praying this through. But what I'm trying to say to us and to all who are Christians, the spiritual inheritance is yours. Don't let the devil rob you. Don't let him say it's not true. You're not worthy. You can't come. Yes, you can. That you're not forgiven. Yes, you are that you haven't got anything to offer anyone else in this church? Yes, you do. Have you ever even thought to say, Lord, how can I pick up a crumb off the floor to give to this person? Because there may be something in you they see that sparks that, I'll eat from the crumbs under the table. I need a tiny thing from God's hand, from the Lord to bless, and from little things. Jesus said it's the smallest seed and it grows into the biggest tree. He has chosen you. He has blessed you. And she says this, for such a reply, you may go. In other words, your faith, he's back to that. Your faith, your trust that I am the one who can command is so great. I am stunned that a Syrophoenician Greek would have such guts. 
The same with the woman who touches the hem. It's got nothing to do with his hem. It's got to do with who she knows he is. And she's not afraid to ask. She's not afraid to touch. Which brings me almost to the end. So are we afraid to ask? Are we afraid to go to our Heavenly Father and say, all right, here I am. Listen to my cry, what we just said. Hear my prayer. Hear my prayer. And he may take us deeper. He may say, no. I'm sorry, he might. One of the most moving scenes for me in The Chosen that I've, is when this bloke's told he's not going to be healed. But God's going to use him for great things and he goes around healing people and he's never healed. And yet God uses him, even in those midst. I was told of a young man, a man I know greatly. Sorry, I, I know him. He was going to a great conference to be the, get the, the main speaker. Couldn't wait. Halls full of people hanging on his every word. He was snocked off his bike by a car. Ended up in hospital for six weeks and couldn't go. And yet, do you know what happened in that hospital? Let me tell you, please. Someone had been crying out to God, if he exists, to show him. This young man was in the bed next to him. And he witnessed to him and he got saved. How can God not be told to be so glorious that he would take a man who couldn't wait to speak at a major conference and put him in a hospital bed because another man had been crying for a crumb from the Lord's table. Just a crumb. And the Lord sent him. Am I asking to be put in a hospital bed? No, not really. Would I be angry if it happened? Probably. But let me ask you this. If that was you in that situation, what would you do? Would you rail at God? Would you be cross at God that that thing you'd worked for had been taken from you? Or would you say, Lord, what do you want me to do? Is there a crumb from your table I can give to any of these in this room? Is there some way, Lord, that I can use what you've given me to be a witness to someone else? I say it carefully. I'm not trying to big up the idea of, you know, when Sally and I grew up in church, we were told going to Africa was brilliant. Having your children killed was what? No, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about this idea as we as Christians have been given all these spiritual blessings. They belong to us. We're grafted in. I haven't got time to go back over the whole thing with Israel, but we're grafted in. All that belong to them belongs to us. All the blessings that are theirs are ours. We're grafted in. So to fit with this morning and to stop here, then we cry, Lord, let us give some crumbs to those who are Syrophoenician, who are outside, who don't know, who are struggling, that they may find in us the very thing we found in him when we first came to faith. So that they may say, metaphorically, they go home and they found their child lying on the bed and the demon gone. So they go home knowing that they are now forgiven. They are a new creation and they're on the same road as you and I. That the old nature's got to be crucified now and they have to go on, go on. Ike, we have to go on, go on. And they will struggle and they will fight and they will fall and they will get it wrong. And sometimes if they come from a certain area like I've said in Harper hey their language might not change for a little while but it will they may smoke still and we may think it disgusting but God will work on them it's for us to give them crumbs of spiritual support and I finish there so that's what Jesus is doing he's not I had to put this in real context because it sounds like Jesus is being awfully offensive to this woman and he is he's pushing her away and he does sometimes push people away because they don't want to follow him the rich young ruler others the nine lepers he lets them go so he's prepared to say to her, it's not your time. This is not yet, not now. But her faith is so strong. Her desire for something from God so great, he answers it. And here's my prayer, that we will get people through those doors or outside when we go who are so desperate for a crumb from the Lord's table that we will be able to give them something that will bring them closer to finding Yeshua as their Messiah, as he has found us and chosen us. But again, let me repeat, we need to pray. We need to pray. This is a church with one prayer meeting a month online. One will be coming back. We need more. And we need people to commit to pray. And we can do it on Zoom. We can pray on Zoom. There's nothing to say that you have to always come out to church and get in your car. We can do it online. It's there. But let me say we need to pray. And pray and pray and pray again. And seek his face crying to him like this Syrophoenician woman, Lord, give us the crumbs, give us something. All this is ours and we want more. We want the souls, we want the lost, we want the broken. Come on. I said it this morning, do it anyway, finish there. So let us stop. And John's going to sing, I've lost my piece of paper now. 